This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. So hello everyone, uh, welcome to the second lecture in our Carbon Smackdown series. My name is Jeff Miller and I'm Head of Public Affairs. Uh, over the last year you've probably heard a lot about carbon sequestration or carbon storage as it's more commonly called. Uh, there's much, been much less talk about carbon capture. Well, you can't store what you can't capture first. So today we present two lab scientists, Jeff Long and Nancy Brown to help us understand how carbon capture actually can work. And as always, we will take questions at the end of the presentations, so we will start with Jeff. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit of the research that's going on at the lab involving trying to capture carbon. And when you see carbon capture or carbon dioxide capture, that's usually referring to trying to extract CO2 from power plant flue gas. Um, but in addition, after myself, Nancy Brown will talk about the ideas of possibly capturing CO2 from the atmosphere, where it's much lower in concentration. And so why are we doing this? Uh, I hope all of you have seen this alarming type of data. So here is CO2 levels in our atmosphere rising very rapidly. We're at about 390 parts per million. And the scary thing about this is that if you look at uh, a lot of different data, but here's ice core data, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere does track with temperature on our planet. And uh, if I were Al Gore, I'd stand up on a ladder, but here is where we are now, 390 parts per million. We haven't been this high. In fact, we haven't been above 300 parts per million in the last 400,000 years. Okay, so this is, this is really, um, kind of frightening, at least to me. And so uh, where is all this CO2 coming from? Of course, you know it's coming from burning fossil fuels. And so the major culprits uh, in terms of CO2 emissions are currently China and the US. Um, and all told, around the world, we're emitting about 30 billion tons of CO2 per year. This is an enormous, staggering amount of CO2 that's being emitted, and it's mostly coming from burning fossil fuels in power plants and also in cars. And so in the US alone, uh, about half of the CO2 emissions are coming from power plants and about 30% comes from the transportation sector. The bulk of that trans transportation sector involves passenger vehicles. And so if we wanna stop uh, this CO2 emission and try and bring back uh, normal atmospheric conditions, then we really need to stop burning fossil fuels. Um, however, there's no chance that you're going to really go without heat and power, electricity, or driving your car. Um, and so while we're looking for this renewable energy um, to do all these things, we're still going to be burning fossil fuels for a long time to come. And so the idea is that we should try and deal with that at the main source of CO2, which are these power plants. And so the idea here is that this will be a stopgap measure while we develop renewable energy technologies, um, but we're gonna try and stop that CO2 that's being emitted from the power plants. And so we're going to, and that's going to involve taking the CO2 out of the exhaust gas from producing the power, transporting it uh, usually by pipeline to some site where it can then be injected underground and stored underground for hundreds if not thousands of years. Right, so that's the hope. Um, and in this process, there's a huge cost in terms of energy. And so overall, with our best technology, uh, this is going to cost about 30% of the energy that's being generated in a power plant to do all of this. And of that 30% energy penalty, most of it is in the capture process, in the method of extracting just the CO2 from this flue gas so that we can put just that underground. We don't want to waste all of our energy on compressing all the other components of flue gas, nitrogen, water, 
and putting that underground. We just want to focus on the CO2 and putting CO2 out of harm's way. And so this energy cost is, is what I'm going to tell you about our efforts to reduce that cost. And so in one of these power plants, uh, you're burning coal or natural gas. Um, but the kind of, uh, after you, after you uh, do that uh, burning of the fossil fuels, the kind of thing that comes out in the stream are, first of all, there's particulate carbon. Um, that's that's cer certainly something we don't want to let off into the atmosphere. And so they, you can try and capture that. There's also um, small amounts of gases that lead to acid rain. And we've become reasonably good at uh, extracting those from this flue gas. And then the new part that we'd like to add on to these power plants is some technology for grabbing the CO2 to put it underground and letting these innocuous species go off into the atmosphere. Right? And so this is what we're concerned with. So here's the um, contents of that flue gas. And you can see most of it is nitrogen coming from the air that's being used to burn the fossil fuel. Uh, about 13% of this mixture is CO2. There's a little bit of water, oxygen, and then these minor contaminants. And so this is a low pressure gas stream. It's at about one atmosphere overall. And what we really want to do is get that CO2 primarily away from nitrogen, which is the bulk of this gas. And so that's not an easy separation. We need to differentiate these two molecules, CO2 and nitrogen, that are actually quite similar in their properties. They're both inert molecules for the most part. But one thing CO2 does is it reacts with amines. And so you can have this reaction with an amine to make a, a nitrogen carbon bond. And that's a reaction that doesn't happen with N2. And so this is one way of just selecting the CO2 out of that gas stream. And so this is our best current technology, is using aqueous solution of molecules such as this one to grab the CO2. And the problems are manifold with this procedure. Um, with these strong bases, corrosivity is a problem. It's a liquid. Liquids have low surface area. You're trying to interact that uh, liquid with a, a gas stream that's coming out of your power plant. So surface area is an issue. There's huge uh, needs for pure water to do this uh, process. And then finally, there's that energy penalty of about 30%. Right? And so our goal is to try and eliminate some of these problems. And so we do have a center here um, at UC Berkeley and at the National Lab involving the people uh, that you see listed. And the center is, is really devoted on trying to develop new materials that would be the next generation of capture materials that could lead to a smaller energy penalty for the CO2 capture. And so here, uh, you can see our two goals are really capture of CO2 from power plants, but also from natural gas deposits. And the same types of materials can probably work for both of these processes. And so we're focused on particularly compounds called metal organic frameworks and polymers. And I'll just introduce briefly um, these metal organic frameworks. And so these are a new class of porous solid materials that were discovered in the past 10 years. And they're composed of inorganic units connected by these, these organic linear bridging ligands. And so this is benzene dicarboxylate linking a little zinc-4 oxo unit. And those linkages extend in three dimensions and create a three-dimensional framework uh, which can withstand vacuum. And so when you produce this compound, it comes out of solution, and it has solvent in all these little pores that you see in the structure. But like a zeolite, you can heat it up, drive out all of the guest solvent, and the, st the structure remains intact. And so the important thing about these materials is that the result of extracting the solvent is you're left behind with a huge internal surface area for the material. And so these are surface areas higher than any other materials that are known. And so one of these compounds, if you take one gram of one of these compounds, uh, this is about a gram of one of these metal organic frameworks, that gram of material can have a surface area of five or 6,000 meters squared per gram. That means one gram has the same surface area or even greater than a football field. Right? And so the reason that's interesting and important for these applications is that surface area is what gases will interact with, allowing you to store them more densely or capture them in a dense form. And so for example, um, if you want to store methane or CO2 or acetylene in a dense form, then the best way to do it currently is to fill your pressure cylinder with one of these metal organic frameworks and then pressurize. 
And so here you can see some data, but the bottom line is if you fill it with this material, you can store nine times the amount of CO2 as you would if you didn't add the material to the cylinder. Right? And so this is all coming from that surface area and the fact that the gas molecules love to stick to that surface. They love it more than they like to stick to each other. Okay, and so the, the question uh, beyond storage capacity for the gases is can we tune the surface so that it will only attract specific gas molecules in a mixture? And our mixture is going to be flue gas, and so we want to tune these surfaces to just absorb the CO2 out of the flue gas. And so one way, of course, that you could do that is to dangle amine groups off of the surface. And so we're trying to create these frameworks with dangling amines where you can have a solid absorbent that the CO2 would stick to the surface. Another approach is actually to make frameworks where you have these exposed metal cations at the surface. Right? Here is a two plus metal cation that's accessible to the surface and gases coming in can feel that positive charge. And the important thing here is CO2 is, is more polarizable than N2. It's easier to push the electrons around. And so that means CO2 will prefer to stick to the surface over N2. And you can actually adjust the energy of that interaction by changing the charge density at this metal cation site. And so we'd like to make these types of porous materials with variation of the metal cation, which is going to adjust the strength of this interaction and the strength of that interaction is very important because it dictates the amount of energy you have to put in to get the CO2 back off and then reuse the material. Right? So regeneration, energy penalty, uh, we're looking to lower that and yet still have a strong selectivity for CO2 binding. And so it turns out to be very difficult to make these materials. We know these structures are possible. We can calculate that they should be stable, but the synthetic route to getting to those materials is a very labor-intensive process. We have to change many, many variables, and we can't predict the outcomes of these reactions yet very well. And it's very sensitive to things like what solvent you use or what mixtures of solvents you use. And so we now use a high-throughput technology. This is a robot that's setting up reactions, uh, and it sets up an array of about 100 reactions at a time. And so we can screen different reaction conditions and see which ones lead to uh, our target compound. And so this is just showing you dimethylformamide with a little bit of one propanol gives us just the right uh, mixture in, of reaction conditions to generate this framework where we've now got cobalt two plus on the surface. All right? And all these other conditions lead to either mixture or something else entirely. And so this speeds up the uh, synthesis of these new materials. Then the other slow step is actually measuring the gas sorption properties. Right? And so what we'd like to do is to measure data such as this. This is just showing increasing pressure at 298 Kelvin room temperature. And this is what we'd like to see. We want to see CO2 absorbing while N2 has little affinity for the surface. And so we'd really like to see at this low pressure, this is the partial pressure of CO2 in the flue gas, we'd like to see uh, as, as high a loading as we can get. And that loading is going to scale with the surface area of our material. But measuring this data takes uh, a lot of time. And so one of the things that we're just starting to develop in a new project that's being funded by ARPA-E uh, are high throughput methods for screening the products that we get from these reactions. And the first screen uh, will involve NMR methods where the dynamics of solvent within the pores should allow us to get a, a profile of what the pore sizes are in these products. A lot of the outcomes of these reactions are non-porous materials, things that aren't going to be good for carbon capture. We know roughly the pore size we want. This technique should allow us to rapidly identify which of these are interesting MOFs to pursue. And then the second part that will speed things up a lot is actually measuring the gas sorption data for many compounds in parallel. And so we're building instrumentation to do that so that we can screen maybe 40 compounds at a time and that'll speed up discovery by a factor of 40. And so uh, with that, I'm going to hand off to Nancy Brown, and she's going to tell you about a much more difficult and less developed um, problem, which is trying to capture CO2 from the atmosphere, the air. I'm going to talk to you about a very different process, and that is removal from the, of the carbon dioxide from the air. 
We call this direct air capture. We use the abbreviation DAC, and I'll use that throughout the talk. And I will tell you up front that there has been very little research in this area, but it's one of great interest. And I hope I convince, can convince you that it is important for a number of reasons to do research in this area. Uh, I, I might start out by telling you that, that um, whether or not to do research in the area is quite a polarized and charged issue. There are people that believe that, that DAC research will lead to complacency and reduce mitigation efforts. People will think, oh, there's a solution down the way. We don't have to do anything about this. There are others that think that we need to do research to really establish the cost of DAC and that these costs, if they're as high as people think they might be, should demolish arguments for procrastination about other mitigation efforts. I see DAC research, or we see DAC research, as a type of planet research. We think that if we're very lucky, using some of the techniques that Jeff outlined, it could lead to a significant breakdown, that, a breakthrough that might reduce the cost by a factor of five or 10. We also think, and I think this feeling is shared by many, that doing good research and getting good data would enable us to put a realistic ceiling on, on cost and this would allow us to compare, in a relative sense, various mitigation techniques. I might say that DAC, at the cost of about $100 per ton CO2, is something that might be economically viable, especially for overshoot trajectories where the CO2 exceeds concentrations that we think are healthy for the planet. Shown before you are two schematics. The one on the right is a DAC plant that might be comp that might be common to all separation technologies. Right at the middle of the, of the diagram are, are two systems that are at the core of all carbon separation uh, protocols, whether or not it concerns flue gas or natural gas or air. Each of these systems is characterized by having a CO2 absorption system and where the CO2 is absorbed in a selective manner. Uh, also is the regeneration system where the absorbent regenerates the concentrated CO2, it passes to a compressor where it's compressed, and then it's sent to a reservoir where it's stored. Associated with all these processes are the need for energy, perhaps water, and of course emissions of CO2, and it is the, the energy penalties right now that are in fact the showstoppers. On the very left of the diagram is a plant uh, concept that has been designed by David Keith, who's one of the outstanding workers in this field. And this is the kind of plant, it would be pointing toward the uh, atmosphere in a single direction. We've rotated one of the buildings so that you can see that it has huge fans associated with it, which take energy, to entrain the air. And this is the size of plant that you might envision to remove one megaton of CO2 per year. And it has a, a spatial need, if you will, of about five hectares, or 50,000 meters squared. It consists of about 10 buildings that are about 20 meters tall, that are about 250 uh, uh, meters long. And, this, and to calibrate what one megaton of CO2 a year means a natural gas plant at about 500 megawatts generates about one and a half megatons of CO2 a year. Uh, so I, as large as this seems, to reduce uh, 50 parts per million from the atmosphere over the course of 100 years, that means it's going to take us a long time to get rid of it, would require about 4,000 of these plants. and so. Even though this seems large, this isn't the land use problem that is associated with other mitigation techniques. So in that regard, <laughs> carbon capture from air at least does not uh, have, be seriously in jeopardy. There are significant challenges with removing carbon dioxide from the air. The first of these is one you might imagine. It is a huge scale problem. There are 3,000 gigatons, a gigaton is a billion tons, 
of CO2 in the air, and its concentration is about 0.04 percent, one three hundredth of the concentration that's in a flue gas. So just think about the differences in volumes that you would have to deal with in dealing with removal from the air versus removal from flue gases. There's also a pot potential interferences from other gases that are in the atmosphere. In Jeff's diagram, he showed you that we could remove PM from the flue gas, we could remove NOx and SOx from the flue gas, but we can't remove these things from the air because the volumes are just too large. And, not, and, and when we do removal on a metal organic framework, the CO2 acts as a weak acid. Anything that's a stronger acid, like NOx and SOx and some of the acidic constituents of, of aerosols are going to interfere with that removal, which compounds our, our problem. Uh, the, the CO, another thing that, that is a problem is the CO CO2 and the concentration in the, in the output gas, and I'll describe that in a subsequent slide. Finally, the conditions under which the removal take place are very important and can't be controlled, so we have to be very strategic about where we locate plants. Wind velocity is important. Humidity is important. The temperature of the air are all important constituents in affecting the chemistry and affecting what happens in the pores and actually affecting how we can entrain air into the capture facilities. On the slide before you, I show you the energy penalty associated with direct, with capture of, of CO2 on the left on the, on the uh, ordnance, and uh, it is plotted against the percent CO2 removed from the input stream. And we, see, and we also see a number of curves. Each of these has a different concentration of CO2 in the input stream, and two things stand out. Number one, the larger fraction of CO2 that we remove, the larger the energy penalty, and also, the smaller the concentration of CO2 in the input stream, the larger the energy penalty. So our targets for removing CO2 from flue gas are about 90 percent, whereas our targets for CO2 from uh, air are about 50 percent. And so that also will affect the economics. Finally, the chemistry itself has significant challenges. The good news is we learn a great deal from the work that is ongoing on removing CO2 from flue gas, and we have automated, automated devices that are going to enable us to screen molecules for efficacy, but we have less control over conditions. Therefore, the, the constraints on the chemistry are much more severe. We have to synthesize new designer molecules that are effective sorbents and efficiently regenerated. The chemistry is going to be very different. They're going to be different molecules, but they're likely to reside in this class of molecules that we call metal organic frameworks. The sorbents need to be very much more selective. They need to be more sensitive and more strongly binding. Uh, also, the regeneration is going to be more complicated because water has about on the order of 1 percent, I mean air has about on the order of about 1 percent air in it. And the regeneration step is probably going to be more complicated as a result of this and might involve two or three step chemistry. On the slide before you, uh, you see what I call in the center of the slide the normal evolution of a technology. You take it from basic research, it goes through R&D, through a progression of steps, and then ends up with end of life commissioning when you try and return the land, the water, and the air to the original conditions. In Carbon Capture 2.0, we want to change this paradigm and we want to really facilitate the development of technologies and expedite their creation. And we're going to do that by building teams of basic researchers and people that do research in energy, environment, and economics so that they can work together to really shorten the time horizon for this development. In the horizontal part of this slide, I've indicated some of the issues that will be important for the analysis team working in concert with the basic researchers to examine 
in the carbon capture paradigm. They'll have to learn and, and continue to analyze and evaluate the energy requirements, the materials requirements as new candidate molecules become available. Does the world have enough of these chemicals to accomplish something of this large a scale? They'll have to look at the siting issues by characterizing the meteorology, making sure that, and, and understanding its variability, understanding atmospheric composition. NOx, for instance, in the atmosphere varies from 0.02 to about 2,000 ppb, parts per billion. Can we find areas where NOx concentrations are very low and the wind speed and wind velocity do not vary very much? Those are the kinds of questions we'll be answering. On the right-hand side of that horizontal line, we see that we have to tackle environmental issues. How much water contamination will there be? Will the other energy sources have environmental problems associated with them? How will these affect human health? How will these affect global warming potential? These questions will be, be answered in concert with the re research and development. I'd like to focus a little bit more on the analysis by showing you the, the, the diagram uh, in front of you. We're going to be doing a lot of modeling and building very complex modeling frameworks and systems. On the left of this diagram, you can see the various inputs uh, for, the, for the models. We'll be looking at material stocks, water issues, energy issues. What kind of inputs do we need to drive models that will let us um, evaluate the energy penalties associated with DAC? What will we need to know about the contractor, the regeneration schemes? How often will we have to replenish those? How will these drive back to the materials concerns? How will we treat, we will need input composition of the atmosphere, input meteorology, and then those questions that are posed in the middle about raw material supplies, plant and manufacturing construction, operation and maintenance, and end of life deposition. And the output of such mo models will be global warming potential, human health costs. Now, how are we going to get these? I'm, I'm talking in, in, in kind of jargon. For instance, for these two, we'll probably do modeling on the continental and regional scale. It will involve solving the cons conservation equations uh, of energy, mass, and momentum. We'll do this for a number of chemical species so that we can look at how, uh, what the meteorology is associated with a particular site, what the gas compositions are, how they change diurnally, how they change uh, over seasons, so that we can begin to assess how much we might be able to operate a given DAC capture plant. We will then take some of the issues associated with pollution and translate these through exposure models into human health kinds of paradigms that we can monetize. And we will do the same with global warming potential because it will take energy to drive all these, all these um, issues. I'm going to conclude with this slide and, and just emphasize to you that I've told you something about the difficulties in achieving direct air capture. I've also talked about its special challenges possibilities for success and um, conclude with hoping to convince you that it's important to perform research so that we can really assess its cost. Thank you.